News from around the peninsula. Absolutely four things you must know about coffee and an insider's look to Xi'an, China. All this and more coming up next. The Chi Ranger Podcast starts now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the podcast. My name is Steve Miller, the Internet's Chi Ranger, and I am absolutely fantastically jazzed to have you here on this week's podcast. I am having a lot of fun for the last few days. It has been pouring rain here in Korea, and finally, the weather broke. I'm looking out my window, and there are some fantabulous blue skies. So as you can tell, I have my yellow technical t-shirt on. If you're watching the video podcast over on my YouTube channel, if you're listening to the podcast, sorry, you can't see me. But as soon as I am done recording this podcast, I am jetting outside for a run. And I have to tell you, I am really excited to be able to do that because I sat down this morning and I planned out my training schedule. And if all goes well, and I'm praying that it does, by the end of November, I'll be able to hit that half marathon deadline that I've set for myself. And more so importantly, I'm, I'm kind of trying to reach a point where I can run about 10 miles a day just for my fitness run. That's what I'm aiming for. But as you're joining me today, Sunday, I want to thank you for downloading the podcast either from iTunes or ChiRanger.com or watching the video podcast over on YouTube. So without further ado, let's get kicking. Let's jump into the news. And I need to start off by saying the news segment is going to change just a little bit. Last time there was so many there were so many stories about American politics and different things. And I really wanted to taper that and really focus on Korean news, East Asian news, travel, and specifically educational news as it pertains to those coming to Korea or Japan or other areas of the world that are teachers or working in the ESL business. So from here on out, that's going to be the focus of the news segment, East Asian news, travel, and education. So without further ado, let's move on to some of the stories that made the headlines this past week here in Korea. Uh, with election season approaching, not only in the United States, but here in Korea, uh, I'm starting to see a lot of, I want to say, American political tactics come about. And what I'm really referring to is the fear mongering. Now, a few of those that are going into the election cycle here in Korea are starting to play upon the diplomatic row over the islets in between Korea and Japan. I'm specifically talking about Dokdo as it's referred to here in Korea and Takashima as it's referred to in Japan. They're calling for an alarmist saying with Japan revitalizing and revising their history and not really expressing remorse over the actions that they did during the occupation period and during the Second World War, will Japan rise up once more and exert a military influence over the region? Trying to instill some fear so that people will vote for that person in government to kind of quash that notion, to bolster Korea's defense. And I think that's a really poor, poor showing. Not only here in Korea, but really around the world. I really am upset when politicians try to play the fear card. Unfortunately, with people's busy schedule most often there is not time sufficiently to research the fact check statements and more and more people just really rely on the sound bites so as you're moving into elections here in korea and abroad please 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 when a politician says something or you see an ad on a paper or on television please take it with a grain of salt it's marketing it's trying to get you emotionally charged about the topic and make a somewhat uninformed 
decision. So please take some news about that. Specifically with Dokdo and Takashima, Takashima uh, last week, uh, Tokyo handed to the Korean government a note verbale. Now, this is a diplomatic document that is unsigned. It's considered to be more formal than just a verbal request, suggesting that both countries take the issue to the International uh, Court of Justice to be finally settled. Now, here in Korea, it's the Korean government's position that there is no territorial dispute. The land is firmly Korean, and they sent back the letter unsigned, unopened. And this has also contributed to a souring of relationships between the two countries. And I have to say, I think that sending it back unread, unsigned, maybe not have been the best approach, but certainly stating that this is not an issue for the International Court of Justice is absolutely right. There really is no territorial dispute. The land is most certainly Korean. And the reason why I say that is if you look into how these courts handle disputes for land, there are really four different areas that they look at. Number one, proximity. Now, if you look at where these islets are located, they're for the most part equidistant between Japan and Korea. However, they are closer to Korea. So by that notion, Korea gets, let's, let's, let's count it up. Korea gets a point for proximity. The strongest part of a court's decision on who gets the land is effective control. Now, since the end of the Second World War, Korea has had people on the islets. There's a Coast Guard base there. There's a fisherman and his wife there. They have effective control for nearly 65 years. There's, that's undisputable. There are people on the island. Point, again, to Korea. Acquiescence is another factor in a court's decision. Because Japan has not really pursued putting people on the land, they've kind of acquiesced that portion of it. And it also comes into discovery as well. Prior to the acquisition of Korea, the annexation of Korea by Japan, as early as, as late as the 1880s and early as uh, around 1900, Japanese textbooks printed by the Japanese culture ministry labeled the islets as Korean territory. Again, acquiescing control of the island, acquiescing discovery of the island to Korea. And the islets were not actually named Takashima and added to the Shimanhe prefecture until February 22nd, 1905, right when colonization was really beginning. So again, if you look at the litmus test for ownership of disputed territories, the edge goes to Korea. So there's no reason for Korea to really take up Japan's offer to take this to the court. It's a voluntary court. And why waste time when the decision is so apparent? Unfortunately, this issue is spilling over into a whole other number of areas. Uh, Japan has suspended purchasing Korean designed amphibious assault vehicles, despite these vehicles being called the best design by uh, Secretary Gates from the United States. Unfortunately, it's causing some other issues because now Japan is looking at another model made by the United States in lieu of this Korean amphibious assault vehicle even though it's the best in the market. So you have one country saying, all right, we're going to take our business away here. We're going to give it to the United States. And again, the United States is kind of put in the middle of this argument. Uh, so that is an issue. And unfortunately, because of that and all the other issues surrounding the dispute, the joint military exercises that Korea and Japan typically hold in preparation for retaliation against North Korea, China, and other forces in the area, those have also been suspended. So again, you have the two major military forces that are allies of the United States not working and playing well together 
which can contribute to other problems in the area. And I really think that it's unfortunate that such a petty issue is causing so many problems in so many areas. It's something that really does need to be resolved and needs to be resolved quickly. And until then, even the Joint Military Information Act that both countries had agreed to, but because of all the rows with Dokdo and Takashima, they pulled that off. So the intelligence services of both countries are not even sharing information that's very vital given the relationship with China and North Korea these days, and even with Iran, with some of the deals that North Korea and Iran are working out. It's something that really needs to be focused on and resolved as quickly as possible. But coming to the domestic side of Korea, while Korea is generally a safe place, something very terrible did happen earlier this week. And in South Joyo province, uh, in Naju, a seven-year-old girl was kidnapped from her home beaten and raped. It's a devastating attack. And 160 officers went looking for this individual. And it's not the first time something like this has happened. There are a lot of issues with sex offenders here in Korea. A lot of calls for more strict punishment for these individuals. They're looking into chemical castration for the individuals. I just really hope that as more and more people come into Korea, that these types of crimes are really dealt with more severely. A lot of times, the court system, in order to try and save face for people, tries to minimize the disgrace that a family will feel because of such a violent act. But in my opinion, going after a child, especially as one, as, as, as young and innocent as a seven-year-old, this guy is a sicko. He needs, he, he needs to go away permanently. There, there is no place on earth for an individual like this. Uh, another news item that came out this week, which I thought was kind of interesting given that I come from the United States, and that is that Korean banks and other financial institutions are finally moving towards a paperless system. And I say thank goodness for that. Coming from the United States, I've had paperless billing for years now. And the notion that here in Korea every month I go down and I get a long bill of my utilities. I can't have that emailed or sent to me via text. Uh, the same goes with my gas bill. I see no point for that. And one of the things that really irritates me about financial transactions here in Korea is that so much revolves around your bank passbook. Literally, if you have a job offer or you, you go to work for a new school, in order for you to get paid, you can't just give them the bank and the account number. You actually have to physically show them a copy of your passbook. That's the only way that they will verify that this is really where you want the money to go. There's a, a what I feel is a genuine distrust or an inability to say, here are the numbers, let's move forward. So I'm really looking forward to having these papers just go away. We have a file here with a lot of our cell phone bills and cable bills and internet bills and apartment bills that just really just rack up space. They're great for going back and, and seeing the actual amounts in each individual category over the years. But again, in the United States, I had paperless billing for my gas, paperless billing for my electricity, for other utilities. I just simply got an email. It was a PDF. I could save it. I could go on to the company's website and retrieve it later. It was really, really the way to go. And I'm jazzed to see that that is finally coming to Korea. And I hope, really hope, that paperless transactions goes across the board. Because I hate carrying around a bank book. Uh, some other news in the region. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, otherwise known as North Korea, is continuing to moving forward in its nuclear program. 
uh, Kim Jong-un has shown up some more power, solidifying his relationship with China and possibly getting some aid from them. In addition, Iran and North Korea have signed a scientific and technological cooperation agreement. And this past Saturday, the two nations were deeply at odds with the U.S. and fortified their bond by getting even closer. They stated that they needed to develop these bonds out of concern for common enemies and similar situations, and those being embargoes and bans on nuclear development. And seeing Kim Jong-un change his stance, change his stance so much from the way that his father treated not only his own country, but neighboring countries in the international community, I think really lends credibility to the pundits that have put out there that he is looking to develop a relationship with these leaders, with those within the country that will foster him a greater amount of support down the road. So while those at the senior level may have doubts about his effective ability to control, to lead in the shadow of his late father, his actions are really designed to spurn support and garner support from the younger generations that 10, 15, 20 years from now will be the ones in the key power positions as he goes into his 50s and 60s. And I really think that if you look at everything he's doing, it's all leading up to that. Uh, also in North Korean news, we had the two typhoon typhoons last week and the people's republic the democratic people's republic of korea were certainly hit hard with that a lot of flood in the areas um, tr problems getting food to the people that needed it the most um, several countries offering food aid and of course in some of the areas around the dmz unfortunately since it's still one of the most heavily mined areas in the world when you get severe rain and severe flooding, those mines tend to wash up a little and migrate around. So a lot of cleanup and care is being given to those areas to make sure no people are harmed by these wayward mines. So that is pretty much the big news here in Korea and East Asia. There is one other piece of news in the United States that I do want to share since I do have a number of listeners and watchers from that area. And that concerns a release that came out from the National Park Service regarding Yosemite and Camp Curry, one of my favorite places in all the world. Now, there is a hantavirus threat from Curry Village, the tent cabin specifically, that began this past June. The virus itself is spread through rodent urine, droppings, and saliva. And it's not requiring, and getting the virus does not require a bite, and it can result in fatal respiratory problems. Early symptoms include fatigue, fever, muscle aches, especially in the larger muscle groups, thighs, hips, back, and sometimes the shoulders. These symptoms are, of course, universal, and there may also be some headaches, dizzy, dizziness, chills, and abdominal problems such as nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, and, of course, abdominal pain about that. About half of all hantavirus patients suffer these symptoms. So if you were in Yosemite, Curry Village specifically during the month of June, please get yourself checked out. There is no uh, cure, no antivirus, but if you do have hantavirus, you can be treated and work yourself into the recovery mode if you are unfortunately afflicted by that. So that, my friends, are the top news stories this week. It's time to move on. Moving on to the content rewind. It was a little bit of a slow week here on the Chi Ranger channel, but we did have brand new videos. And on Tuesday, we had the National Palace Museum, part one in a four part series talking about the national treasures and the preservation process here in Korea. Now, the cool thing about the National Palace Museum is this has been a location 
quite literally, I have walked by hundreds and hundreds of times. It's located right next to Gyeongbokgung, really close to the Korean Office of Culture and Information Service, where I have several meetings throughout the year. And even though when I first came to Korea and I would go to Gyeongbokgung, I would actually come out the exit at Gyeongbokgung right next to this museum, I never went there. So when I was developing this four-part series, I said I have to, have to, have to include this in the opening segment. And I was really, really pleased with the museum. I was really astonished to see it being three levels. You actually enter on the second level and then you migrate down to the first level and then finally the basement level. And shooting it actually came out pretty much the way I wanted to. I wanted to record a, a quick intro with the museum in the background and then showcase the items on display and then end with uh, lead into part two and just have the items themselves be the star of the story and thankfully I was able to content uh, contact the folks at the museum and get their assistance and they were very very helpful I said this is what I'm planning on doing I like to come down there and film and when I did they were able to meet me and they gave me uh, a press badge so that People around knew why I was filming, why I was taking pictures. And they were even good enough to give me a catalog of every single item on display. So we have this beautiful hardcover book with amazing detail on every single item on display at this museum. And a lot of the details that I put on that video relayed to the blog article that went with it and there are a couple things in the blog article that actually have been updated since then uh, in the article and on the signs at the museum they pretty much have several Korean tours every day but only one tour in English Chinese and Japanese and as soon as the article went out I got a phone call from the English interpreter at the museum letting me know that come October, they're going to change it to two tours per day. And I think that's really, really cool because it shows that more and more people are taking advantage of this museum and that they see the need for greater foreign language support. And this is even above and beyond the fact that they have the audio devices that you rent for a thousand won. And as you're walking away, you can hear in intricate detail all the, all the material. I also kind of called them out, I want to say. Uh, and I, I mentioned it in the blog post that the location is called the National Palace Museum. So I went there thinking, oh, this is going to be about the five grand palaces of Seoul, a little bit about the royal families. And it was a little bit of a misnomer. There is certainly a lot of information about the palaces. and In fact, one whole section of a floor is just about the palaces, when they were created, how they were created, the architecture, the things that went into each of the different areas, the original names, the change names during the, the engine war when they were burnt down, when they were built up and then demolished under the occupation period. But so much more information is given about the royals. So much detail at this museum goes into the history of the chosen royalty all the way up through the end of the Daehan Empire when Korea was annexed by Japan. It's amazing. Things on display that I never knew that Korea had. There's a special exhibit going on through the end of August. And so it, it's in the process of changing out. But they have all the royal seals from all the kings on display. And there's several others that are actually in the, the royalty section, the, the, the chosen era section, section, section. And you can actually see how they presented their official orders, their, their, their mandates with this massive seal, either in 
brass or in some cases jade and when you look at the jade ones you can actually see the red ink crawling up into the crevices even after all these years it's amazing you have the investitures the eulogies of these kings that have passed away and a lot of them are just simple books but a few of them were written on jade tablets to look like the books so you have this essentially six by nine inch tablet of jade with gold encrusted writing on it and it's simply breathtaking the the video because it's so so dark in this area really didn't do it justice but it was amazing to see it there a, a lot of detail at this museum goes into court life and the music of the court the rituals of the court and if you look at the palaces today you would think that oh okay it was chosen era 700 years ago not very modern and then as soon as you get to the first floor the second level on your journey you have these cars these cadillacs that were driven by the staff for the emperor and the empress beautiful absolutely stunningly beautiful automobiles that were restored by hyundai here in korea they are magical and then you get into some of the other areas the historical scientific advancements of the chosen uh, historical uh, national treasure 228 the stone constellation chart blew me away to see each of these individual pinpoints where the stars were to see the lunar trajectory and the uh, celestial equator mapped out in such detail was fantastic but for me and i really wish i could have shown this in greater detail in the video but for me the joy on the basement level was the self-striking water clock if you've been to Doksugung, you've seen the remnants of this self-striking water clock and you look at it saying I, I really don't get it i don't understand how this device works if you go to the national palace museum you can actually see a video on how this works but i'll explain a little bit of it here because i think you'll get a picture for how cool this device was now it's not a small device i want to say it's probably about 20 feet long and at least 15 feet wide and it's tall too at least 10 feet tall and you have huge huge water vats that pour out water into smaller vats at a prescribed and measured pace and then those keep on trickling down until they fill up a basin. And then those basin push down the plunger. And as it pushes down the plunger, another arm raises up, releasing balls at two hour increments. And then these balls go down various holes until they hit various different levels inside the clock. And as these levers twist and turn, it moves figures inside that hit bells that hit drums that move different figures that specify what time of day it is to see it work is just watching art in motion it is fantastic and i really really recommend checking it out friday's video the ultimate cold brew coffee <sighs> i love coffee it is fantastic. It is the nectar of the gods. But it really hasn't been until I would say like the last year that I really started appreciating iced coffee. I, I, I just I just didn't get it mainly because a lot of times when I have iced coffee, it's because someone takes coffee and it's brewed hot. It's come. It comes out of the machine. It comes out of the espresso machine, and they pour it in with cold water and, and ice cubes. And to me, that just isn't very refreshing. It just isn't very cold. But believe it or not, back in 2007, I first heard about cold brew coffee, and I tried it, and I was not a fan. I, I in fact, the way that I made the cold brew coffee in this video. It was the exact same way I did it in 2007. The difference is, is that now I know 
Now I know, and knowing is half the battle, now I know that the coffee that is produced is absolutely delicious because it's a concentrate. When I drank it before, I just opened it up and whoosh, kicked it back. Was not happy with it. Not happy with it at all. But this cold brew coffee was fantastic. I, I've made it with the Kirkland Colombian coffee. I've also made it with the Highland Grog. And both turned out fantastic. I continue to make at least a liter once or twice a week and use about a 50-50 blend with some ice in there. It is so good. I really, really enjoy that as a treat in the afternoon, especially on some of these hot days. It really, really hits the spot. It's fantastic. And I'm starting to get sold that this is pretty good. There, there are some other manufacturers of cold brew systems out there. A lot of times you can go into a, a smaller independent coffee shop here in Seoul and get Dutch coffee which is a very slow brewed coffee itself. But this is something you can do at home with a French press or, or some other uh, way to have coffee be brewed and then poured through a filter to uh, extract the, the, the grounds from the liquid. Uh, the reason why it's said to be a little bit better than, than brewed coffee is because during the brewing process, because you're using hot water, it leaches some of the acids and some of the other uh, aspects off the bean and it contaminates, I shouldn't say contaminates, it alters the flavor. So if you take a chemical profile of cold brew coffee versus hot brewed coffee, you'd actually find that they have different chemical signatures. And I think that's pretty cool. Uh, the other thing, the other story that came out this week was on Monday and that was a discussion with my students about their opinion of military service here in Korea. And I, and I mentioned this in the article, and I thought it was fairly interesting, that the girls in the class did not want to serve at all, that they looked forward to having their boy, boyfriends go away because it would help them get fit so that they would look better when they came back, and that even though the life of a soldier is very, very hard, and my friends who have completed service have all said it was one of the worst times in their life because of the hardships, uh, the physical hardships of the job, that these boys going into it were actually looking forward to having that kind of structure and that they felt it was their duty. Uh, I thought it was really interesting to get that insight from them. Uh, one last thing that did come out this week was, of course, the podcast extra on Wednesday about cruising with Alaska, cru cruising in Alaska. And that was from my latest appearance on 101.3 Main Street, TBS EFM here in Seoul, where I have to tell you, it was so much fun to talk with Anjun Hung about cruising. I really wish we had a full half hour rather than the 15 minutes that we typically only have for that segment. But if you get a chance to go cruising in Alaska, it's a lot of fun. I really do recommend the White Pass and Yukon Railway and, of course, the Alaskan Zip Line. Those two excursions that we did were fantastic. You can look back over the videos on the Chi Ranger channel and find those. It was tremendously fun. Absolutely. In fact, if you go to season season three, episode number one, you'll find links to those videos themselves. So those are the big stories this past week. That is the Content Rewind. Now it is time for the quintessential quartet four things that you absolutely need to know and this week we're talking about one of my favorite things in all the world coffee so some interesting facts about coffee that you need to know number one coffee was actually discovered in the ninth century by a young individual his name was kaldi and he was a goat herder. He noticed that his goats were acting a little bit strange. They were a little bit jittery, moving around. Some people might say it's a dance. And they were eating these cherries from a tree that he wasn't familiar with. So I don't know if he 
was wise. I don't know if I would be as bold as he was, but he tried some of these cherries himself. He got a little jittery, and as time progressed, that's how coffee was made. You take the cherry bean, and now you roast it, and you create this delicious beverage, and it really dates back to the ninth century. So that is the I guess the origin of coffee as most subscribe to it. Uh, number two, contrary to popular belief, when you look at a coffee roast, a dark roast actually has less caffeine in it than a light roast. So think of it this way. If you're cooking with alcohol, whether you're making beer battered fish or you're using some wine in a sauce, the hotter the temperature that you're cooking with, the longer that you're cooking with, the more the alcohol burns out. The same goes for caffeine with the beans. The longer you roast a bean, the more that caffeine goes away. Now, I think this really hits home for me because I particularly like the flavor of a dark roast. I do appreciate light roast, but for me, the the way that i enjoy coffee i love really deep dark rich roasts and i'm able to drink two or three pots in a single day without getting the jitters now when i say pots i'm thinking of a standard american coffee maker or a coffee press eight to ten cups so i'm talking what three times eight 24 to 36 ounce servings of coffee that's my normal coffee consumption of a day and i can drink that no problem when it's a dark roast i haven't tried it really with a light roast mainly because i usually find the flavor very light i'm not sure why that is but i don't think i would be able to drink as much coffee with a lighter roast because of the increased caffeine amount in those beans. Number three, and this really, really needs to be hit home a lot. Espresso. Espresso is a method of preparing coffee. It is a brew method. It is not a type of bean. A lot of times when you go into a store, you'll see espresso beans or espresso roast. That's really not correct. Beans are roasted light, medium, dark. They come from a wide range of countries in the so-called bean belt around the equator. And that's about it. Espresso is a way to push pressurized water to create coffee in a small amount uh, there's a higher concentration of suspended and dissolved solids. There's a little foam on top. And it has flavors and chemicals in a typical cup of coffee. But because of the pressurization of the water, it's so much more concentrated. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people who like brewed coffee don't necessarily like espressos because of that concentration. In fact, a bonus, a bonus quintessential quartet. Cup of Joe originated during the Second World War because Americans liked coffee. They didn't like espresso, so they would take their espresso and water it down, thus creating the Americano and the Cup of Joe. All right, so number four on our list. Let's talk about beans and the number of beans. There are, in some cases I've seen, up to 50 different species of coffee beans. There are really three that are probably consumed the most. The number one consumed coffee bean in the world are the Arabica beans. That accounts for almost 70% of all the coffee consumed in the world. So chances are when you go out for coffee, it's going to be Arabica. And number two, you have the Robusta beans. Now, this accounts for nearly 30% of the coffee consumed in the world. But of note, the caffeine concentration in the Robusta is actually stronger than Arabica. Almost double that, or I should say 50% more caffeine in the Robusta beans than in Arabica. And making up 
a little less than 1% of all coffee consumed are the Liberic, Liberica, blah, the Liberica beans, which are of my beloved type of coffee, Cape Baraco, the manly coffee from the Philippines. I really love it. It's really strong. It's really delicious. Love that. I'm looking forward to having some more authentic Cape Baraco when I go back to the Philippines this upcoming winter. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, four things you have to know about coffee, the quintessential quartet. It is time once more to set course for adventure. And today I am lucky enough to have on the line a very special gentleman. He calls himself a travel addict and is the man behind the art of backpacking. Please help me welcome Mr. Michael Tieso to the podcast. Michael, welcome. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me. I am jazzed about this. You have a fantastic destination in store for us today. Where are you taking us? Yeah. So we're going to Xi'an, China. Ooh, I've always wanted to go there. It's one of the you know, highest locations on my must-go-to travel list. So what can you tell us about Xi'an? Well, especially if you love history, Xi'an is really great for that. Uh, Xi'an is over three, the city's been there for over 3,000 years. It's got a bunch of history, and uh, it's one of the oldest cities in China. So it's definitely great for history buffs. Oh, I didn't know it was and one of the oldest. like a bit of like culture as well that's different from the big cities like Beijing and Shanghai. Oh, okay. So, so, so if you if you look at Beijing and Shanghai, what are some of the differences in in in, in, in Xi'an since you say it has such a different feel for it? Well, Xi'an has tried to keep the look and feel from back in the day. They didn't try to demolish a lot of the roads. They tried to keep it. So if you start driving around the inner city, the roads are quite narrow, and they tried to just keep the same essence of just an historic uh, city. So they didn't try to like, they have a lot of uh, rules within uh, the city center to so not build as high and try to just keep the culture uh, intact. Okay. Unlike Beijing and Shanghai, which is huge skyscrapers and everything's been, you know, completely 180, I'm sure, from hundreds of years ago. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, very cool. Uh, so if, if we weren't to go to Xi'an, how, what, what, the, what are the best ways to get there? Well, if you're already in China, I would say the most interesting way would definitely be uh, to take a train. Because you're getting kind of a culture experience out of the train rides as well. Especially if you're sleeping on the hard sleeper, which is like the more local way of traveling through the trains. Which is like just bunk beds. And the, the problem is that the trains, unless um, you're okay with it, it's just they take a really long time to get there from Beijing to Xi'an. It looks like it might be a short ride, but it's really like 13 hours. Oh, really? So, so what, what what gives the appearance of a short ride? It just, uh, if you look at it, because China's so big, you're looking at from Beijing to Xi'an, and it looks like it might not be as far, but it's really actually quite far, especially from Shanghai or many of the other cities. There's really not another big city that's really close to Xi'an. Most destinations will probably be... 12 hours. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's a huge chunk of time. Uh, about how much is a train ticket from, like, say, Beijing? Well, it should be around 250 uh, RMB. Um, okay, so that's about 40, 40 US dollars. Not too bad. Yeah, which is pretty affordable, and that's for the hard sleeper. The soft sleepers might go up to 300. Okay. And if you want uh, comfort, the soft sleepers are quite good. They're really comfortable. Are there any domestic flights to get there? Yeah, there's plenty. Actually, when I was there, they were building a whole other extension to the airport. So oh. now I'm sure by now the, um, they're even accepting even more international flights and domestic flights within Xi'an. Which is really good because they're just getting so many tourists now. It's become like the next best thing to do outside of the Great Wall. Oh, well, oh, fairly interesting. Uh, so once you get into Xi'an, how easy is it to navigate the city? Xi'an is interesting um, because they've never actually had a metro. And it's only until recently, since last year, that they built the, their very first metro system. And they're continuing to try to make it easy to get around. But otherwise, you don't really need um, 
a bus or a taxi or anything. It's it's a walkable city, which is really nice. It's kind of like if you've been to New York, it's just you get to just walk around and just enjoy the city for what it is because it's so lit up and pleasant and street food and just uh, people, you could just people watch the whole time. Oh, very cool, very cool. Uh, any other forms of public transportation in the city? Well, they got the normal buses, but it's it can get quite crowded during the busy hours. And the taxis, I would just say, just take as many taxis as you can because they're pretty affordable. The only thing is, well, of course, everyone speaks Chinese. So you need to uh, have, if you don't speak Chinese or you don't know how to write Chinese, better have it written down to give to the taxi guy. <laughs> Very true. Now, as far as Chinese, there are several dialects. What Do they speak Mandarin in Xi'an or a, another dialect? Yeah they, yeah, they speak Mandarin and they have their own uh, Xi'an is in the Sanxi province, and they actually have their own dialect even within the city. Oh, so wow. the dialect within the province and within the city. Oh, but funny. mostly everyone speaks Mandarin. Okay, very cool. Um, as far as finding a place to stay, what kind of uh, accommodations are available? You know, this is what I really love about China. I've been to many other countries in the world where... The, the hostels might not or they're like subpar they're okay and i'll sleep in them but they're not that great but in china the hostels there are just fantastic they're really great and i don't know it's like the level of this the, the the comfort they give you they go the extra mile to make sure that um they can show you the city and to make sure you understand what's happening because everything's in chinese and if you don't speak chinese it's really hard to understand that culture and i think the hostels do a good job and showing you their city so 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 can you give the listeners an example of of your personal experience of, of how they went the extra mile so i was in well this is a different city but i was in chengdu and the same thing happened in xian it could happen anywhere in china but they organized an activity uh that would take you it was free activity by the hostel and it said just sign up and let us know that you want to come and the activity was a tea making ceremony in the park and we were just playing board games at the park but we were the only foreigners in the in the park and there was just no way we would have been able to find that park and we were just there with everyone else we felt like we were just in china in the park having some tea playing uh, board games and and a hotel wouldn't be able to do that. Or it was just like activities that the, the people do in that city, and we were doing it. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And and were they able to were, were they able to speak a fair amount of English to communicate with international travelers? To you know, like, like you said before, you need to have the addresses written down in Chinese to give to your taxi drivers. Were they able to do that translation for you? Yeah, the hostels and hotels, they all speak English. Okay. But outside of your hotel and hostel, it's zero English. Like, just none. Maybe you'll find some signs, but uh, usually not. And if you do see a translation, it's horribly translated. And it's, it's just as hard to understand sometimes. <laughs> uh, speaking of hotels, are, 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 what are the hotels like? I stayed in uh, one hotel in Xi'an, and it was called the Sofitel. Mm -hmm. I was uh, just taking my girlfriend out to this beautiful hotel. It was a five-star. And um, they can be to the same price levels as it would be international, maybe around $300 a night in mm -hmm. some of the hotels. But... You get really great service. It's just like being in most hotels around the world. You just really get no good service. But... Oh, very cool. All right, so as, as you mentioned, uh, Xi'an is becoming maybe the, the second tourist destination in China after the Great Wall. What are some things to do in the area? Well, everyone's heard of the great terracotta warriors, and I think that's probably... If you're going to visit Xi'an, you got to see the terracotta warriors. That's what you go. What a lot of people go to Xi'an to do. When they think of Xi'an, they think terracotta warriors. It's the same thing with Beijing, with the Great Wall. If you're going to go to Beijing, you're going to go to the Great Wall. And that's just like the, their biggest attraction. Mm -hmm. And uh, with thousands of soldiers and 
the horses and chariots. You have to go there to see that. It's really interesting. What, what, I, oh, I, I was going to ask you, you know, when you went and you first laid eyes on this historical site, what did you think? It's much more impressive knowing the history than actually seeing it in person, actually. Okay. Uh, I would suggest for anyone visiting to do some research on what you're seeing because it's hard to Im- imagine what you're actually looking at without knowing the history behind it. If one of the things was I didn't even know that thousands of the soldiers are still being dug up from underneath. Like They've only gotten like a quarter of them. Mm-hmm. So there's still thousands of them under there. They've only recently discovered it in 1974, which is really interesting how it's been there for so long and no one even knew. Can you imagine? Maybe there's more stuff down there that no one knows. Well, yeah. I mean, if you look at, look at places around the world, we have all these sites that you would think because of their immense size, everyone would know about it. And then you have the story of some guy walking in the jungle, tripping over something, and it unearthed or begins the process of unearthing an amazing site like Chichen Itza or uh, Bora Bador. And it's, it's, it's amazing to think that there are such great places still left to be discovered. Yeah, I think the story with this one, there was a guy that had a well, and he was just getting some water and came up with uh, uh, some ruins. And, that's, and then he just found that. So now he's just getting tons of money through the sites and of course you have to give it to the government but but still I mean I mean e- even if I, I I say that now not having discovered anything but God you know, can, can you imagine the the sense of national pride you must have of, of being able to uncover something that yeah. grand uh, what else is there to do in the city or in the nearby area well um, the most obvious thing is you need to get into the city uh, you're gonna see bell tower and drum tower and those are in the directly directly inside the city center and uh, you can within those towers you can go up and see like a little overview of the whole city mm-hmm. and those are pretty cool uh, just to look around and buy some souvenirs and see an overview of the city because from bell tower you're like at the direct middle almost and then you can see from all the, the streets that hit the north of the city wall, the south, east, and west, you can see all the way across. Oh, very cool. It sounds like a great great way to take in the city. Uh, other things to do? Well, uh, the city wall, actually, yeah, the, the city wall itself, it's actually one of the biggest in the world that's still intact. And it surrounds the, um, the whole city center area. It's huge. It's really, really big. Is and it? on one of the days, I took a bike. You can rent them on top of the, the city wall. You can just bicycle the whole city wall to get... It's a nice thing to do maybe on your first, second day to just get a a nice glimpse of Xi'an and the different things it has. Oh. It took me an hour and a half to bike the whole thing. Oh, excellent. Sounds like a really nice... Uh, would you say it's more like a fortress wall type type thing with, with yeah. gates? Okay. Uh those yes. that have been to other areas can can certainly relate to that, and you're you're right. Those are a great way to to see the city and experience the the sites that are there. Uh, you can't you can't travel on an empty stomach. So, uh, how's the food situation in Xi'an? I think Xi'an's got one of the best foods in all of China. I really, really mean that. And it, it's Xi'an has got some excellent. It's a, the nickname for Xi'an is Snack City. And when you have a name like that, it's got to be good. So you can basically walk all around the city, and you're going to find street food just everywhere. You come coming out of what's really cool is I used to come out of like nightclubs or bars or karaoke, and then you come out and there's just street food all over the place. And that was the best way to end the night with some just really delicious food. So, but, so what, what were some street foods that you would recommend to people? Well, the best place to get street food in all of Xi'an, I think, is in the Muslim Quarter. Oh, really? And the Muslim Quarter has a ton of street food, just filled with it. But they come out, like, at night. During the day, there's maybe a few out there scattered around the city. But the Muslim Quarter at night really lights up. Okay. Just... So, so what are some of the dishes that you really enjoyed while traveling there? Well, a lot of the street food, let's see, um, 
Well, this one is not so much just street food as it is also just the dish itself. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, mutton and bread piece, bread pieces in a soup, and it's called Yang Ro Pao Mo. So it's like a soupy dish, but it's got lamb and bread pieces in it, and it's delicious. But it's known for only Xi'an. You possibly you can get it in other cities, but it's not going to be as good as it is in Xi'an. Okay. So that's what they're known for for that dish. Okay. Are other dishes that you really uh, made it a point to get? Uh, they're really also famous for their noodles in Xi'an. While other cities might be known for their more of their rice dishes, mm -hmm. Xi'an is really known for their noodles. And you can get hand-pulled noodles. So you can watch the guy pulling the noodles and making it and putting it in the pot. And I would just love to order it just to watch the guy make the noodles because it was pretty fun to see them. I don't know how they do it, but they stretch really, really far, the noodles. Yeah. And faster than it. It's like as if they're making like a jump rope out of it. Yeah, and I, I've seen it done several times both here in Korea but also on television shows. And I'm always amazed. I've always wanted to try and do that. Have you have you ever <laughs> given that given it a go? I feel like mine would just hit the ground or uh, they, they're pretty good at it. They make it into like a jump rope. Yeah, it's it's it, it, it's quite impressive uh the the way that these these master cooks can take just some flour or whatever else they're they're making out of the noodles and just weave it back and forth to these long strands of goodness that just pops in your mouth. Yeah. Um, any other tips for travelers headed to Xi'an? Well, I would definitely say because um, Xi'an is even less known for having English than Beijing in Shanghai that you definitely need to make sure you have things written down there's less English speakers there uh, although it's just as touristy but there's going to be less English speakers uh, I don't know what that is it's just uh, you need to make sure to write down the places you want to go to I what I always do is um, have the card of the hostel or their hotel mm -hmm. always on me so if I get lost I can show the taxi driver or somebody on the street and point to the card and then that they know what I'm asking for uh, great tip great tip any other tips uh, Xi'an is easy to walk around I don't think it's really necessary to take much uh, public transportation you the only public transportation you're going to need is to go to the terracotta warriors so you, I think that as long as you get a hotel or a hostel within the city center then you don't need to worry about how to get around. And it's just a nice old traditional city. You're going to just love walking around. So it's pretty easy. And the the locals over there are very curious about foreigners. People are going to come up to you and want to talk to you. But uh, I wouldn't suggest... I would be careful of all the scams, of course. It's just uh, when you're talking to them, just like any other city, really, Talk to them, but don't go anywhere with them. Okay. Very helpful. Very helpful. Well, Michael, thank you very much for giving us these inside tips and taking us to Xi'an, China today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, my guest today has been Michael TSO. He runs theartofbackpacking.com. You can follow all of his adventures on Twitter at The Art of Backpacking. Now, you can find these links in the show notes over on chiranger.com. Again, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. My friends, that will just about do it for this week's podcast. I want to thank you all for watching over on YouTube, downloading the podcast from iTunes or on ChiRanger.com. I really do appreciate it. I'd also like to thank Michael TSO from TheArtOfBackpacking.com for joining us this week on the podcast, sharing his insights on Xi'an, China. If you know of someone who loves travel, who loves learning about Korea, or wants to be kept apprised of the news in the area, I hope you'll take the opportunity to share the podcast with them. It's a way for us to grow, and I really love hearing comments from around the world. So if you have a thought about the podcast, please leave it in the comment section, either on chiranger.com 
or on YouTube. You can also send me messages at podcast at chiranger.com. You can also keep up with all my activities on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just look for Chi Ranger there. But until next time, may you stay true to yourself and always, always be awesome.